Oh, uh, we'll introduce you first. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome Arthur to the group today. He's a uh, PhD student with Dan Brown at UCL and um, works mostly on quantum error correction. And today he'll be discussing um, bias tailored uh, 3D topological codes. Yeah, thanks, Joshka, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about our recent paper on tailoring 3D topological codes uh, for bias noise. Um, this is John Wall, who is uh, Eric, who is a PhD student at the University of Maryland. Uh, Chris and Mike, uh, LRP for a postdoc uh, at uh, ETH, very um, So, as the uh, yeah, so uh, as a general overview of our work, uh, what we show in the paper is that under bias noise, small changes to 3D topological cuts can result in big improvements uh, of the performance. I'm going to like break that down into some bits. So, um, so Yeah, so first, uh, bias noise. What do I mean by bias noise? I mean that, uh, so I'm talking about Pauli noise, and I'm talking about the case where Z viewers, for instance, are more likely than uh, X and Y viewers. Uh, this has been experimentally demonstrated in some systems. So, for instance, uh, for cat qubits, uh, both dissipated cat qubits and cat cat qubits, uh, you have this type of uh, bias noise. Uh, and like typical bias levels that you can find in some experiments are uh, eta equal 100, uh, which means that their errors are 100 times more likely than uh, X and Y errors. Uh, second thing, 3D topological cuts. Uh, so in our world, we considered three main uh, cut families. Uh, one is the, the first one is the 3D topic cut. Uh, this, then the three color code and also like a fragment test. Uh, then what do I mean by small changes? Uh, here I'm talking about this notion of key fault deformation, uh, which is when you apply a key fault gate, typically you have a uh, on one of the axes uh, of your code, or like on like some of the like a given choice of qubits uh, of your code. Uh, and so it changes the stabilizers and it mixes X and Z, turning like CSS codes into non CSS codes as well. So, would you also consider uh, Clifford gates which are not ten, like transversal? No, usually I consider uh, trans, so I consider like one gate per qubit. Okay, so, only single, not, so local Clifford uh, deformation. Yeah, here it's even more than local, it's like one gate per qubit. Okay. But what could also consider like um like higher weight Clifford circuits, which I've never seen in the literature, strangely, but this makes a lot of sense for the correlated noise or so. Yeah, I guess it could. Yeah, I haven't seen it considering the literature either. It would make the stabilizers a bit weird, but that I guess that could work in principle. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. To make it bigger. Mm -hmm. It it increases the weight of the generators. Uh, yeah, it could increase the weight of the generator. Okay. Depends on, yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah that's a good trade. Um, uh, then we also like, we not only consider like the like people deformations, but also like the dimensions and the layout of the codes. Uh, and we introduced the notion of like rotated 3 3 code, and we show that by people deforming that one, uh, we get some nice uh, properties. Uh, then what do I mean by big improvement? The first thing is that we show that like for all the cuts we consider in our work, uh, we obtain a threshold of 50% that you can buy us. Uh, and we also show that for like some boundary conditions uh, and sizes, we have like a nice sub-threshold scaling uh, that now scales like the number of QB, like here like for three guys DQ or the distance of the cuts. Uh, which is improved over like the normal case of exponential minus R5. Okay, so what are you gonna learn in this talk? Uh, there are like two main points that I want to convey. Uh, the first one is like, what are 3D codes and why uh, are they interesting? Uh, and I'm gonna talk about like all the different properties that make them interesting, like signal shutter correction, or software correction, transversality, uh, the fact that they are like different phases of matter, et cetera. 
Uh, and then how to prove that a cut has 50% threshold where I'm going to introduce the notion of materialized symmetry and uh, the thing that we introduced called rate reduction uh, and also like how to do mapping to repetition cuts so like how it helps us to find those methods. Okay, so first I'm going to present uh, like give you a sort of tour of three topological cuts. Uh, then I'm going to uh, present uh, clipboard deformations of quantum cuts, uh, both in the 2D case and in the 3D case. Uh, and finally, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, cut boundaries and how it can improve uh, such as a scale. Okay, let's start. So, 3D topology of cuts. <clears throat> so, why are 3D cuts interesting? Uh, there are many reasons for that. The first one is that they can implement uh, transverse Samuel support gates. So if you remember from the uh, basic quantum recollection, we have this uh, fundamental theorem called the Brodicon theorem that tells you that uh, transversal gates of the D-dimensional codes are restricted to the D level of the clipboard hierarchy. Uh, so what does this mean? For instance, it means that 3D code can in principle implement the T gate transversally, what 2D codes cannot in terms of like restriction of the in the clipboard hierarchy. Uh, and so like in the 2D case, uh, you need to use very costly methods such as magic set distillation. And in principle, like, yeah, because like it's like do, do people know like a sequence to like a gate that yeah. implements it? Okay. Yeah, but yeah, um, because here I'm talking about like 3D code in like the whole generality, right? Okay. Uh, but like for the 3D surface code, the 3D color code, for instance, we know how to make uh, okay. how, how do you do it? It's like transversal, so you just do like your, your so you apply the T gate on every qubit as so a T like yeah, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, well, nice. yeah. but but it always depends which realization you um, yeah, but of the three D color code you look at, for example. Um, I mean, there are some where you if you apply T gate, it does like on a logical level, it doesn't like a different logical gate in the same Clifford hierarchy or something. Okay, or but that, there are examples where you apply D yeah, yeah, to every qubit that implements logic key gates or something equivalent. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. And for the surface code, you just apply CCZ between all the qubits. Uh, like you know, in yeah, the yeah. that's the CCZ is transverse. It's just because I remember the blocks, so yeah, between different blocks. Okay. So I remember this one code where you apply T gates on every qubit and that implements CCZ. Or SK. No, it was TGS, I think. Yeah, this is one example where, uh, where I was saying before, but this is due to the fact that this code mm -hmm. um, encodes more than one logic mm -hmm. qubit, and then yeah, yeah. But it's guaranteed that you it's will be in not. the same hyperclipper. Oh, really? Hierarchy. Ah, interesting. Like there are yeah topological reasons for that. I thought like algebra. Okay, interesting. I mean, both these is typically depending on what the three. Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks for clarifying. Like it a non clipper scale, a clipper scale event, like having one of the few. So it's in there. Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so like some of you might be wondering, like, I don't know why, like, since we also have this other theorem called the like extended theorem that says that no cut has a universal set of transversal gates. So what happened with that with uh, three cuts? Uh, but uh, just the yeah. question, like the Bradley Koenig theorem goes beyond transversal gates, right? Goes it's it's about local 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 preservation, local preservation yes. locality preservation. And Easton Mill is only talking about like really unitaries that are tensor product of unitaries. Yes. Like it's um, yeah, that's a good yeah. point. That's a good point. Yeah, that's like yeah, Bradley Koenig is a bit more general. Do you think that Easton Mill is is, is um, applicable to a less um, oh. large sense of generality than Bradley Koenig? The Bravi König is for topological codes and concerned with locality preserving channels or unitary channels. Okay, fine, fair enough. I see. And East and is for any stabilizer codes, but for unitaries that are tensor product of local fine. unitaries. Yeah, I understand. Hmm. Any stabilizer code. No, no, yeah. it's a different theory. It's like, no, it's like, yeah, even not the same. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good to know. <laughs> There's some group that has like so like so on finitely the, many uh, connected components and then uh, that thing. <laughs> yeah, but like those things here are concerned with like different things as well. Like Brad Kunick talks about like the people hierarchy or like uh like uh and so this means like for three D color, for instance, like we're gonna have um 
on how to yeah sorry here yeah, I meant like a peep of gate so like a switch on how to peep of gate that cannot be even listen uh, for instance a Hadamar uh, but for those things actually usually like pretty you can implement them uh, non transversally so for instance if you want to implement the Hadamar you can just do like state injection uh, you don't need distillation because the plus state is easy to prepare you just prefer the total in different basis uh, so yeah basically like Hadamar is like pretty easy uh, you state population. So that's why we say often that, like, for instance, the 3D uh, toric curve has a universal set of gates. Uh, okay, second property, uh, they can have single shot error correction. So let me explain that a little bit. So imagine that you have uh, some errors and that the syndrome is defined as being a loop when you're on the air, uh, which is different from like the Case of the surface code, for instance, where you know that like usually the syndrome is at the end of that chain uh, of errors. Here we have like you can imagine the errors and then a membrane of error and then a loop around the membrane of errors, uh, which is typically what happens in like a lot of assumed codes. Uh, then what does it mean to have single shots? So here, like a, an example would be that uh, imagine you have like some syndrome uh, measurement errors, then you get like this like sort of uh, cut syndrome then what you would do is you would do uh you can like sort of recover the syndrome because like the syndrome grows the size of the error so there's like enough information sort of do a matching within the syndrome recover the syndrome so get rid of like the measurement errors on the syndrome and then once you have the syndrome or like your predicted syndrome you can do like the degree and uh Having single shot error corrections mean that basically you can do that and you don't need to like have repeated uh, single measurements. Because like just with a, only one uh, single measurement, uh, you can uh, have a decoding solution that's uh, that's good enough, that's for tolerance. Uh, so for instance, uh, the street theory can color code can do single shot for one type of error. So I, I don't know, let's say for instance, that errors. Uh, but subsystem uh, three codes can uh, have, can have that for uh, all type of errors by using like this procedure of uh, you can make it work for like all type of errors. Uh, uh, could you give some intuition how uh, how it can be done with a subsystem three D tor or color code? So my my intuition is that. Uh, <laughs> You can sort of make it like by using gauge fixing, you can sort of like make Z errors or like make one type of error being like the main one that you're going to do error correction on. Uh, yeah. I, I don't know a lot, like, I haven't like studied them so much, but that's I think that's my intuition. Okay, okay, I see. Uh, then there is this notion of uh, partial separation. Uh, that you can do with some type of silicons. Uh, so what, what is self-correction first? Uh, so self-corrected quantum memory is when you put a code uh, in a thermal bus and the current time of the logical qubit is exponential uh, with the lattice size. Uh, so without like any uh, decoding needed. So what it means is that it's sort of like energetically unfavorable to grow the error, which is not the case for the to the surface code, for instance, because in the 2D surface code, the energy is just uh, like at the boundary, so it's like a sort of constant, it doesn't depend on the size of the error. When, like, if you have loops, then it's going to depend on the size of the error. So it's like uh, for those like self collective quantum memories, um, you, yeah, you like in a thermal bus, you're, you're going to stay, uh, you're, you're not going to limit the degree, and the current sign is going to like improve exponentially. Uh, but we don't know any self uh, corrected quantum memory in 3D. That's like one of the main of the problem. We know in 4D we can like the 4D uh, theory code is a self corrected quantum memory. In 2D we know that we cannot have one, but in 3D uh, we can. However, uh, you can talk about the notion of partial separation, where the current stands the potential up to a given lifetime size and then decreases. Uh, so, how is the bar connecting? To the qubits. So if you flatten out the 3D toric code in, in 2D mm -hmm. and you put a bar, would that work? If you have long range links, like layer layering through. I don't think 
depends so much on how you lay out your picture. But the assumption is like a bounded weight coupling to a complete basis. I think that's the like there's the Stavis formalism <coughs> with which this is usually analyzed, I think. But how is it implemented? I mean, or, I mean, no. So the idea of self correction is that you not you don't measure the stabilizer, ah, yeah. but you implement you imagine the natural Hamiltonian of your system is okay. the stabilizer Hamiltonian. Uh -huh. And then you have kind of a okay. the Hamiltonian of total system is bath Hamiltonian plus stabilizer okay. Hamiltonian of your and then a coupling and this coupling is assumed to be local. Okay, so that's, I think that's the assumption. So you cannot just. Okay, I see. So, yeah. so if you would flatten it out, you have the wrong Hamiltonian. The, the Hamiltonian is not local anymore, okay. Rudy. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. But the intuition is really that you have like a sort of like Boltzmann weight for each yeah. uh, error that depends on like the energy of the error. So if it costs, if having like bigger it costs a lot of energy, then it's going to be like really unlikely. So you're not going to go with here. So you don't know that. Okay. Yeah, and so like codes like a uh, half on, on some codes that have this uh, partial self correction is really so for instance, a half code uh, half this partial self correction. And you say that partial self correction goes beyond um, single shot. Uh, what, what, what is the connection? I, I, I don't see this. What is, what, what is the connection between single shot error correction and um, self correction? So yeah, the, the, there is a connection, which is that uh, if you have single shot, it usually means that you have like a syndrome that grows here. And of course. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. And then you get the, you get the the greatest time that's exponential in the data size. I understand. Okay. Exactly. So that would be an intuition for the Pauli theory, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that is not like a necessary condition. Uh, so like for fractions, for instance, you uh, yeah, you don't have exactly just like loop. Uh, excitations, but yeah, you have some partial separation because the radicals grow as a fractals. And, yeah, that gives this property. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. And, okay, and, and fracton codes are not single shot error correctable, am I right? Uh, we don't know, I don't think we know any way to make them single shot directly. But it could still have a long decoherence time, so it's a one sided argument, right? That's the, the upshot of your point. Mm -hmm. uh, but they could still be uh, have long coherence time, exponential in the letter size, uh, fracton codes. Um, Only to the point. So fracton codes definitely don't have like in Sweden, they don't have uh, complete self correction. So you, you can find you can find like very big errors that have like a very small syndrome. Mm -hmm. Okay. For those fracton codes. Thank you. So there yeah. is some of them. There's also a paper I think on thermal stability of fracton order or something, um, uh, where they. Just like kind of a logarithmically growing uh, coherence time or something. Anyway, like it, it, it was, yeah. Yeah, that's almost like early work, Yeah, and so finally, is that they correspond to like a new phases of matter that I think are pretty interesting. Uh, one reason they are interesting is because, for instance, uh, we know that like two different dimension invariant static data codes uh, have been fully classified for prime dimension of few bits, uh, and they are all copies of the two bit uh, So this has some caveat points. We find some assumptions that we see here. So, for instance, for hyperbolic codes, it's not exactly that, like this theorem doesn't apply exactly, but in general, we know a lot of things about two bit codes, and we know that like a lot of them are just like copies of uh, two bit codes up to local unitaries. And so we can classify. A lot of those uh, to the phases of matter. While, like on the other hand, super codes are much more diverse. Uh, for instance, we saw the example of fractions, uh, and classifying all the super phases is still like a, an open problem. So we could find like a lot of like really interesting uh, super codes in the future. Uh, I don't understand the two D translational invariant stabilizer code part. So yeah, uh, yeah. What is meant with copies of 2D torque codes, or could you give an example of yeah. a stabilizer code and how it relates to some copy of 2D torque? Yeah, code? the color code, right? Okay. The color code is like two copies of the torque codes. Okay, I see, I see. Uh, so basically everything is like yeah, the color code, like it's multiple copies of, of the torque code. Uh, uh, and you can have like different qubits and different, yeah, different uh, D-dimensional systems. 
and you're still always going to go back down. Okay. <clears throat> and you're always going to have like string logicals and uh, string onions. And, and what's with the prime dimensional qubits? Uh, uh, so you like QD toward D is a prime. <laughs> Yes, I understand, uh, but is there some reason why others that are non-prime are difficult to classify, or I why they're not interesting? I don't know exactly the proof, but uh, it's like it's related to the fact that ZD is a field of D prime, so I guess it has like some properties that, yeah, makes it like easier to classify yeah. them. But like last okay. year, Tyler Ellison, Don Williamson, and so on, they did a paper on non-prime uh, yeah, codes Paul. where they. Um, used anion condensation to define yes uh, uh, okay. codes on uh, non-prime dimensional qubits, which were not like which were some twisted quantum doubles. So outside. So an example I see is the Semyon model, uh, which is yeah. that for. Okay. okay, thanks. Yeah. I mean, oftentimes you can consider like prime powers, and then often like the, the same things still work. But does this really only work for primes? This no, I think it only works for primes. Okay. Not for prime power. No, because that for primes. Yeah, but uh, GF four. Yes. Uh, yeah, okay, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. uh, so there are some like proofs for like single shot error correction and like conditions that you need to establish them in uh, quantum codes. So yes. Is there uh, an equivalent list of statements for partial self correction? I don't know of any general. Principle. Usually, you always have those fractal behavior. And I think in like most examples, we know it's like we, we have this like fractal. So it seems like you're, what you're saying is that uh, partial self correction manifests under the condition of some symmetries on the level of the system that you're considering. Yes. Okay. Yeah, some type of fractal symmetries. So, like, we have examples of like 2D codes that include bias, for instance, that have partial self correction uh, because they have this fractal logicals. Yeah, but I mean, like with a fractal, it's more than a fractal logical, right? It's, I mean, like, yeah, it's like a black propagation. Sure, but I mean, like, if you look at the field theory, for instance, where I think things become much more obvious, like you've got an intrinsic UVI or mixing so field theory is, uh, has a discrete uh, symmetry group involved in it. And this just like manifests some level of the lattice. So I think what you're saying is that as long as you have this kind of symmetry present, uh, it suffices to, or it should suffice to have some form of partial self correction. But I think it relates to how the like to which geometric object um like how the symmetry is represented. Yeah, but it's like a on a group yeah, it's a discrete gate group. But the question is, is it like um often these fractals are related to like these higher gauge theories where higher, the object higher, higher categorical symmetries. No, they are two things. No, no, no. It's when you write down the field theory, it's generalized for assignment theory. It's not a general term. It's like, well, one is like the Tory code, which is just pure as up to gauge theory. But this is a generalized symmetry. And that generalized symmetry manifests on the level of the field theory, which corresponds on the lattice. Yeah, but not all of these higher symmetries give rise to a fractal model. Yeah, yes. yeah, and then yes. they also, that's like not only the presence of such a symmetry, that's true. That's it, true. it has to have some relation to the geometric structure of the representation of the symmetry that this lattice manifests, kind of. Maybe you yes, can discuss that. Yeah, yeah. I also like find very interesting. Uh, yeah, so so three D cuts seem uh, amazing. So what is the catch? Um, so first of all, like the obvious point that they require a higher connectivity. Uh, so if for like super connecting qubits, it's going to be like very hard to implement them, for instance. Uh, second one is they also require more qubits uh, to achieve a given distance uh, and to also like the rates to achieve like a given number of like uh, logical qubits uh, that you implement. Uh, and so we mean that this idea of overhead can make the non people gates actually more costly uh, than magic statistization. Uh, so, for instance, there is this paper uh, by Alex Kubica that showed that on the cost of universality, uh, that showed on the comparison between the gauge color code uh, and the, um, yeah, a process called code switching when you go from like 2D to 3D uh, color codes and doing like magic statistics on the color code, they show that it's actually like a very similar. So it's not really worth uh, doing 3D models, basically, examples. 
However, I think there are several reasons to be optimistic. Uh, one is all the recent for and single shot decoding. Uh, for example, it's pretty consistent for record, and that has shown that there is like a considerably improved uh, threshold if you take like the single shot property into account. Uh, then there is like a notion of fractal three code, which is completely different than fractals, has nothing to do with fractals. Uh, but those fractal three code are just like three codes where like you remove a bunch of qubits uh, in a fractal way inside, but you can also like remove like almost all the qubits that are inside your three code and still like preserve a lot of the uh, properties. So you can, by using those fractal three code, you can improve the qubit ones uh, quite a lot. Uh, this hasn't been uh, studied in a very like, systematic uh, resource estimation way yet. And also maybe like this work so that like bias noise can improve uh, the threshold uh, a lot, both by using keyboard deformation and even without know, keyboard deformation, so that these are studied. But if some system have bias noise, then that might actually be more Okay. Uh, so here are the three main code families, and I'm going to like show them to you like on some visualization tool now. But basically, I'm going to talk about like the three theory code, the three color code, and one type of fraction code called the X2 model. In the paper, we talk about like a lot of different variants of within the different families, but I'm going to stick on like one variant of family. Uh, so the three theory code first has those stabilizers. So it has uh, so we have like a three D grid, um, and we have one Z stabilizer per vertex. It's like a white six stabilizer, and then we have like plaquette stabilizers, and we have like two bits on it. So very similar to the two, two literary code and three D. Then the three D color code uh, is a bit more complicated. So we have those uh, truncated of tahedron here uh, that we can select them on a three D lattice, and we have set cell stabilizers and plaquette stabilizers. And finally, fraton code. Uh, here we have a stabilizer on. Uh, on cubes, so each cube is like a weight 12 stabilizer. And then we have three stabilizers per vertex corresponding to like different planes, and they're all like weight. Uh, are these uh, like an X group model or a general fracton chain of type one? Are they all the type partially self correct? I don't think so. Yeah, that's okay. Good. Good. And when you say, for example, X cube models, um, like what else do you consider? Uh, has code, like the hack code and uh, second C code, so type 1.5 and type 2. Uh, yeah, those what are the most for me. This is the one with the non string light. Just type 2. This one has string light. Okay. Uh, yeah, so type 1 has string light. Uh, yeah, and type 2 doesn't. And yeah, it's type 1.5 or whatever. So. <laughs> I think you explained this to me, but I forgot. Uh, why is this a 3D color code? Or what makes it a color code? Is it? Uh, so you have like this four color ability property in the lattice. Ah, okay, okay. Ah, okay. So four color ability is also a color code. Yeah. Okay, I see. And he has so, two copies of the 3D target, or three copies. Three copies, yeah. Uh, four, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also the smallest number of colors, of course, right, in 3D. Uh, I guess. Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. So now I'm going to show you some visualizations to so understand a bit more like what those three look like. Uh, so here is a grid for the three theory code where you have like units and edges. Uh, so if you look at the vertices first, uh, so you put like some errors, and we see that errors are uh, have vertices have a syndrome on the boundaries. So if, if you had like exactly that <laughs> uh, and now if you put Z errors. So here we see that it activates faces all around. Uh, and so this is a loop, basically, uh, around the membrane. So we have just one. It's a code loop. Hmm? It's a code loop. It's a code loop. <laughs> it's, a code loop. Yeah, it's a loop of the dual, um, <laughs> I guess. Um, yeah, so here we also see like this loop uh, in the dual that is made of membrane. And I can know. Uh, this is 
So here also we see that. It's going to start with nice. So that errors have this uh, loop like syndrome while uh, X errors have uh, point like syndrome. Yeah, any question on this rhetoric card? What's the name of the software? Uh, so it's online, it's uh, gui.codecast.io. Oh, very cool. Mm -hmm. Like you wrote this, right? Yeah. Yeah. So wow. Is nice. <laughs> <laughs> that some <laughs> Um Then you can look pretty at the three color cards. So no way. Because it's a bit complicated. It's a three color cards. Uh, we draw uh, an error on those. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we draw an error and you get those like four. Uh, it's, it's a periodic like, boundary condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe. And I guess, yeah, if I go, is that error? It's going to have to be the same. Well, nice. uh, yeah, and here, like, we have uh, the cell represents like points like errors, while like the faces, uh, which are uh, like loop like uh, excitations. So it has the same type of behavior as for the screen. Uh, I don't see the loops and the points. Uh, yeah, so just because, like, for instance, uh, I guess if I try, for instance, I put like two errors. Is that a loop? Yeah, that's not the loop here, that's like the point. So, okay, now you have to go. Yeah, so here we see that, like, this sort of propagates, like, we have like four errors and we have like those two, two onions. Okay, and, like, so that's the point. It's yeah. That's a point excitation, but it means that like, okay, okay. we have like string of x errors and we have some stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure how, how a point looks. And yeah. You can also make only one cell light up at the end. So it's... Yeah. What? You can what? You want to make only one cell light, light up light at the point if you choose the right error. Yeah. You like know. this, this you have red to thing is a cell, right? Yeah. Okay. yeah. It, and it corresponds to one step light. Okay. And how can you make light up only one? So instead of going horizontally, you go diagonally down. Oh, yes. So you choose edges that connect only red cells. Just in the 2D color. And this one. Yeah, it will only light up. And if you go, like you can color this edge red because it connects red cells. And then if you make the string along red edges, it will only highlight red cells. Hence the name. And then there's branching rules. Like if you only have one error, you light up one of each color cell. So four different cells because you can. I'm, I'm lost. That, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Okay, so that's why the stream color card. And the last one uh, is the extreme model. Uh, so despite not having partial separation, it still has some pretty interesting properties. So let's look at what happens if I pick errors. <laughs> Um, okay, so when I put an error, we have like those four cubes that light up. I can sort of like propagate them. Um, is that an X error or an X error? Yeah. So, I can, so I can propagate with the, like, those two cubes like that. I can propagate them in the other direction as well. Uh, so here it seems that you just have like a string, a co string, and we have the cubes uh, at the end. Mm -hmm. However, uh, if I try to propagate it on like a different layer, we say it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So basically, we say we call those type of uh, excitations planets because they can only uh, propagate on planes. So they are like sort of confined on the planes. And it's also kind of important that you can't separate two of these cubes uh, without creating more. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah so but yeah, it's like okay, there's exactly. no specific. Uh, this holds for every plane. Yeah. So those are like canons. And then, good. Uh, yeah, and then you have. Is that good or bad? It's pretty good. Okay. Because, yeah, it's like the excitations like remain. It's easy to decode. Yeah. And There's even even like parallel decoders, right? Yeah. That so take like the whole parallel. syndrome and then you can decode on each sub dimension, par uh, sub manifold in parallel. Yeah. Layer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> then, like, if we try to do Z-errors, uh, we're going to have vertex, vertex excitations. Uh, so those can propagate on the line. But if we try to move along, like, any other, any other directions, 
So we need to like basically propagate in like two different directions if you change the background by one because it's yeah. So this is the answer. Cool. Okay, any question on like three D visualization of code? <laughs> oh, we also have passed our code as a visualization uh, because I there know. the the letters is complicated. <laughs> so I have it locally. I don't have it online. Okay. Uh, because of yeah, the logical it's like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I need to figure out that. Um, yes. Can you show the the loops of the color code again? Oh, <laughs> yes. If you pick the four oh, wow. qubits around this plaquette, uh, okay, so like pick this four? Up. yeah, uh, the one, all the ones around this green plaquette, yeah, this will give a nice loop, yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can, can you um, <clears throat> undo one of them? So you have these complicated branching rules. So these plugins come in six different but colors. And there's like rules on how you can like rotate, branch them up. So it all looks a bit complicated now. Yeah. But the simplest one is if you just have yeah. a whole bucket. Yeah. Okay. What kind of engine do you use to render this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Python backend and then it's 3 Is it rendered locally or is it do you have it on the server somewhere? No, it's rendered I mean it's rendered locally. Um, then the priority checks are sent like that. Okay, let's go back to the slides. Okay, so now that you understand everything about speedy codes, uh, we can go to the <laughs> We can go back to the uh, and look at like the key part deformation of the <laughs> uh, So let me first introduce the exaggerated surface code for those who are not familiar with it. Uh, so the motivation is that classical codes uh, often have a fifty percent threshold. Uh, so for instance, if you take the few repetition code, they have a fifty percent threshold. Uh, if you have infinite bias noise, uh, for instance, we are like pure zero noise, we produce the classical code and then obtain a fifty percent threshold. However, the surface cards, uh, many other cards don't have a 50% threshold that is being biased. Uh, for instance, the surface cards are like 10%. Uh, I think it is. So the goal is to find new stabilizers that would work better under bias noise. So we start with this uh, surface card. We have uh, qubits and edges and vertex and packet stabilizers. Then we apply a Hadamard operator on uh, the horizontal axis. So here it turns like all the stabilizers into uh, this like exaggerated X form. Uh, so what infinite Z by S, uh, the Z part of the stabilizer becomes useless because like all the errors are going to uh, commute with the Z part. So we can completely forget about this Z part. So it means that the stabilizers now become uh, just those like two body stabilizers here. Now what happens if you put some errors? Uh, so if I put errors on the horizontal qubits, they're going to activate uh, the vertices. And if I put Z errors on the vertical qubits, they're going to activate the plaquettes. And so here we see like an important phenomenon that is that we cannot propagate uh, the points anymore. So they're like only propagate on lines, they cannot propagate on the whole plane. They cannot compile. Uh, so if you have like extreme bias noise and we have like only dead errors, uh, the decoding problem becomes like very simple because we can just tackle each row of the lattice independently by doing like a one matching problem. <coughs> and the threshold is 50 percent because it's the same as just decoding a bunch of repetition cuts. So that's the main like 
intuition behind why it's at x. Sorry, I just need a translation. So yes. I'm not quantum error correction. So can you clarify what the word threshold error means? What the threshold error? Yeah. So it's like the error rate. Uh, so it means that like if your physical error rate is below the threshold, you can increase the size of the lattice and get like arbitrarily low logical error rate. Ah, okay. So you increase your codes, you, you get better. If you're like above the threshold, you increase your codes, you have more errors and it becomes okay. better. So you are screwed the moment you get this. Yeah. So 50% threshold is like the best we can have. Really. But it also means that if you have a low threshold for any quantum code, you have uh, in your lab, you have to have qubits that are definitely below the threshold because otherwise you have no chance. That's why uh, of doing error correction. That's why people aim to have aim for codes that have a very high threshold. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So 50% is really high, high. the highest possible. Yeah. <laughs> but this is also like only for infinite bias. It is only for infinite bias. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, which is potentially a classical error. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. So. So the hobby is just like, like when you go to like final bias, and then that's yeah. why we do like all the yeah. numerics for final bias, the hobby that is still. Yeah. So the question is how fast does it approach to fix exactly. exactly. Okay, okay. So it's not like correct published. Yeah. And this is, uh, how do they say, code capacity threshold? Yeah, that's code capacity. I don't think measurements like um, the syndrome errors and so forth. Okay. Now there is another perspective uh, on the exact surface code that's actually going to be helpful to like generalize uh, this proof ID to uh, more types of cuts, which is the theory perspective. So let's just take the normal surface code, not exact index, and let's multiply all the vertex stabilizers. Then this is going to give you the identity. So like the multiplication of all the vertex stabilizers, the identity, and say for the flathead stabilizers. So we have this. Identity here. Uh, and this identity is what we call uh, materialized symmetry. Uh, and this leads to a conservation law uh, for the syndrome. Because now, if you take uh, the values of the syndrome, so like those like small uh, S corresponding to like the actual like value of the excitations, so it's going to be like one uh, if you don't have an excitation and minus one if you have an excitation. Then it means that this has to be equal to one. So the product of the syndrome at every point is equal to one, which means that you, you can only have an even number of, uh, of excitations. So you have an even number of minus one in the syndrome. Uh, so a new number of face and vertex excitations, and it means that you can use matching uh, because like you know. Uh, yeah, so you're gonna have like this, this always like a uh, pairs of excitations, basically. Uh, yes. So now in the exact extra test card, uh, we have effective linear symmetries and of course they know instead of having that like, standard symmetry, we have symmetries on lines. So like if we take this stabilizer and we just multiply them on the line. We get on Z, and we said that we don't care about Z at infinite bias, so we mean that at infinite bias uh, we have the symmetry. So now the product of uh, the vertex stabilizers and the phase stabilizer along the line is effectively equal to the identity at infinite bias, which means that you're going to have a different number of excitation along each line, and which means that you can match in all each line. Uh, yeah. Any question on that? So it's just a, like a more general way of like sometimes seeing those repetition codes is just to like find the symmetries. And if you find symmetries on each line, then you have like repetition codes. Okay. But again, it's the fact that on every line that you choose, yes. you can define a symmetry. Yes. And the symmetry implies even number of operations and implies the yeah. And usually, that's, that's still all infinite bias, or um, have I missed something? Infinite bias, yeah. Okay. Because that's, that's not identity, right? You still have those same here. But I think bias is that we don't care about this. Okay. Can I go towards a more presentation? 
Yeah. Okay. So X Y surface code. Uh, so it was actually introduced before the X Y surface code. It's another code that has been to present to us all. I think it by S. So here we also take the surface code. This time we change a bit the like we take the rotated layout. It's a bit more convenient. So we put qubits on vertices. Uh, and we apply a heap of deformation, which is Hadamard and let's take on all the qubits. So this time we obtain uh, those like X and Y uh, stabilizer that alternates in the check of order. Okay. As you see, Z by S, X and Y act similarly. So this model is just equivalent to that. So we just have uh, X brackets everywhere. So basically, equivalent to this model by S. So it means that, like, if we want to have some intuition on this model, you would like that and reverse activate those four branch like and so on. Um, so, questions why does this code have 50% result? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's related to materialized symmetries. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the materialized symmetries? You have an even number of violations in every row in every column. Yeah, exactly. Mm. So you can see that basically. So let's let's do it. Um, so if you multiply stabilizers along a given column, they're going to get yeah, they're going to get the Um so like, let's look at an example. For instance, if you have this error here, we see that like on every column, uh, we have we have always have like an even number of syndromic citations. So that that formula works. What, uh, if you, what, what if you have a code that doesn't give you airlike syndromes? Can we use that? It doesn't give you what airlike syndromes. Um, then you need to add those like boundary defects thing. Uh, and I, can, I guess you can recover uh, even number of citations to add like effect of the one that you can see. Okay. Because, um, yeah, really, really service kind of syndromes are going to be more complicated. Probably. Uh, Not in the best case. Okay. But still, they are, they, are, they are kind of pair like, but not pairs of points, but pairs of loops. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> but I don't know if you pair these then up. And but I mean, you don't have, you don't have those materials in between, so you got without infinite bias and keep on the formation. So that, that, that type of reasoning is really only what happens uh, when you have keep on the formation. Because you want to find lines like in the other things. But you also have pictures for that, right? I mean, you, in the, <laughs> so, I mean, you said, if I may rephrase, like in, Without Clifford deformation, by construction of these topological codes, you have such a materialized symmetry on every code I mentioned zero mm -hmm. manifold, and then you can, which is everything. Yeah. And say <laughs> during these deformations, you can get yeah, exactly. like code dimension exactly. one or exactly code dimension two. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so here we have this error pattern. We have the number of sensible columns. So now, like, how do we do the decoding of that? Mm -hmm. So let's focus on like one of the columns. Uh, we can see that there is a sort of like high degeneracy. So we cannot simply like correct it as before on like one way of like. So we do matching. You say like, let's say we match. Imagine it's like a very big lattice, and we just match this one with this one like that. Uh, so once you have done the matching, we see the problem is that they are like. A very high degeneracy, right? So you can, if you move those z here and you just focus on like one column, you don't know which one you're going to correct. Always push it to So you can do like maybe z here, or you can do z here, you can do like any prediction of how many like, z here or z here. If you can that mm -hmm. edge in the matching solution. Okay, so I do the matching like that, and then I have a high degeneracy of where I put here. So once I've done the matching, so what do we do? Uh, yeah, and also like we can notice that if I put a Z here, so if I change the parity of this edge, now it changes also the syndrome. So it means that what matter is actually the parity. The parity at each of the horizontal edge is what creates the excitations. If you have an even number, we don't create excitation. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. So if that's one matter, it means that like what we're going to predict is a behavior and the parity at each horizontal edge. So if I do the matching, I say this one matches this one, I'm predicting that the parity here is minus one, the parity here is minus one. So you're like it's all the difference in the parity between two between both sides of the using literally the parity of like the number of errors in both sides. So like here there's one error, it's like parity odd. Okay. Here is one error parity odd, here is two error parity. Sure. That's clear? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we're pretty pretty thing, but uh, we don't know. <laughs> Like, like if there is an even number here, so if there is one error here, even number doesn't create one error. If there is one error here, wherever it's like here or here, it's going to create two excitations. Sure. Then if I add like an error here, it's going to propagate this excitation. But it always has to be one error. So it's like excitation propagate if I have one error. If I have two or if I have zero, it won't propagate. So saying that like, like, have you seen room that matches the error that matches that? You're just saying that I'm going to have an error that is, I'm going to have one error on this edge and one error on this edge. So I'm saying that the parity here is odd and the parity here is odd. Okay. The syndromes on the other columns are not updated, right? No, no, I haven't updated. So you're okay. So the matching, okay. So ordinarily we think matching as be performed on the actual qubits themselves. Yes. Whereas here, we're doing the matching on the edges that connect with the qubits. Exactly. So we're yeah. doing the matching on some new operators that are, that correspond to the parity check. Okay, so it's like, it's a new graph. That's the yes. It's the way. Graph. Okay, as a result. So you derive a new graph from the syndrome. Yes. And then perform matching on that meta graph. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, similar how you what do you call it, 3D codes, right? Like the picture shot in the beginning where you first match the syndrome, which is also on a different graph, and then you find it from the. Uh, yeah, I mean that's slightly okay. Maybe it can be expressed in the same way. Is it you mean it's like the meta code and the kind of yeah. oh, okay. but I think it's something simply different. Sorry, is it the same? Thing? No, I just took issue when you said usually you do the matching on the cube. So I'm like, I don't think. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but that's still like how, I, like in a way that I'm thinking about this, I like doing the matching and like some other things. Yeah. I'm doing parity check that would be fine. Yeah. Okay. So the step one is like I've different strategies to match all, match all each column and bring the parity at each horizontal edge. So, and for any materialized symmetry, yeah. you can design such a decoding strategy. Yeah. In my, like yeah, replace. Yeah. The word column yeah. with support of yes. the operator yeah. that defines yeah. the symmetry. Yeah. Yeah. And horizontal yeah. yeah. edge by support. Exactly. By Every time I have a linear yeah. model, I can apply this thing. Good. Um, yeah. So we can do like here the decoding on each column. So we predict here, like we match this one and this one. So we predict that we're going to have odd parity here and here. We do the same on this column and we do the same on this column. And then we get rid of the syndrome that we had before. And this is going to be a new thing because this is a parity check, right? It's telling you like that the parity between those two qubits is out. So we have some new parity checks and we have a new decoding problem. And actually, the decoding problem is defined completely independently on each line. So step two is to my natural metro. So here we select the talks because we have parity here, we have like sort of excitations here and here. And so we are matching here, excitations here, here, we're matching here, and the same. On the last row. So it's a two step decoding strategy. We will first like do a matching on some parity check instead of the qubits, and then we use those parity checks for like a second decoding problem. And this is what we call, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and then why does it have the 50% threshold? Because like at each step, we had repetition codes, and like I could show like exactly like the equation, like the bar bonds. On the success rate to show that, like, whenever we have like this type of, uh, we use this type of uh, multi step because the strategy is the repetition of each step, then at the end we get the 50% Okay. Um, yeah. So that's what I call the rate prediction techniques, uh, something we've been using extensively for 3D cuts. Uh, and 
to summarize once again, we have done like, like we have explained like vertical symmetries first uh, to get a new decoding problem that has those horizontal symmetries, and that solves uh, that solves the decoding problem. And one thing is we don't have to care what happened when we tell one of those repetition codes because uh, when we increase the lattice size, it's not going to matter. Like those repetition codes are always going to succeed. Uh, so as I'm saying, we can like write form like a lot on the success rate. Can you go one back where yeah. you had this um, pair matching? Yeah, um, or even one more where you had these two separate columns or two neighboring columns? Uh, yeah, kind of there. Like there, you have a choice. I mean, you said, okay, I look at this column, and then I have edges where which oh, I assign okay. like an odd parity, and then I put in Z. So I have a have a choice if I put it to the left or to the right. Yes. Um, is there like a clever way, for example, like an A B A B scheme, so that you kind of always end up with a decoding from then every other line or something? Mm -hmm. Like for example, the column that is highlighted now, you choose it to the left, and the column on its left, you choose it to the right, and the column on this left to the left again, and then to the right. Uh, I mean, you didn't do it in this picture, but it mm -hmm. is. Like on every odd column, you put it left, on every even column, you put it right. Such that they end up, like then you will have these only on every other column. Oh, or to rephrase my question, is it helpful to think about this choice or is it in the end, does it matter? It doesn't matter. Uh, like, do you need to put the Z to the left or the right or to put the what? Yeah, because you go through each column and then this has to be consistent with neighboring columns, right? No, no, in this step, not in this step, you just uh, mark the edges purple and then if you go further to the right. Then you choose the that. Then, so if you go a few slides further uh, yeah. here, like if you don't imagine you wouldn't have the sets, that yeah. is what your syndrome then looks like. And now you have to ask on these repetition codes that go horizontally, which pattern of set errors um, gives you the highlighted okay. edges. Okay, so there is no notion of left and right in the first set, even. Okay. Yeah. okay. And okay. If, you had, if you had to tell the repetition code, then probably you wouldn't have found like the right, you couldn't have worked, but yeah. the argument is we don't. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I see. Then I misunderstood this. That's so good that you came to this. Thanks. And so you can rotate this whole picture by 90 degrees. So you first do the, instead of the columns, you first do the rows. Mm -hmm. And then you highlight the vertical edges. And then you do the matching there, which would be exactly the same protocol. Yes, yeah, you can definitely rotate it on your person. And you don't even need that for the 50% threshold. You're saying the infinite bias, just doing one of the two gives you 50%. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm wondering if you if you do the columns one by one, um, if you use some information from the previous column when you decode the next column, mm -hmm. if that could could somehow help. Uh, do, do you know what I mean? It could probably, but it's like yeah. yeah. So you can probably like fine tune this method to get like a, a much better decoder. But we don't care because we never have infinite bias. So it's just like sort of for the sake of the proof. Yeah. And for the sake of the proof, you don't care about what happens when you fail, or you, you don't care about the fact you don't want an optimal recovery, you just want one that gives you. Yeah. Okay. Maybe I didn't understand your question correctly, but you kind of do that because you look at each column, then you highlight the edges, and then I mean, the decoding along this line is kind of using information of all the columns. In the second step. But only in the second step, you know, yeah, I'm or thinking about the first step. Okay, to yeah. already do it beforehand. No, so if in one column you highlight edges, then in the next column you, in your kind of decoding graph, somehow increase the probability that the error occurred there. So your decoder more easily chooses those. But it's, uh, yeah. But in the first step, you're not choosing but an it's error. Threshold, we don't have to think about this. Yeah, I mean, we're trying to implement some of these methods just with a little bit of non but not in the first. I think it's with a fork. That's with the Ethereum or Yeah. Yeah. Because we would keep it the outside of the cut space, not on the time of the Material symmetries don't work anymore. Yeah. So that's good. But then you will have like a lot of, like you. You promise your decoder that there will be an even number of um, excitations in every row, but that won't happen in reality. That, 
Yeah, this is not a correct moment, but it's far from being correct. Mm. It's just a proof. Okay. Yeah, but to be fair, it could, it could still work approximately, kind of like, yeah, right? I mean, so it has yeah, yeah. Like as well. Right. Some ML <laughs> Okay, so yeah, I'm going to have, okay, have 10 minutes and then we'll continue. But I think I'm going to introduce more stuff that I want to introduce. Uh, so just, I don't know if I should say anything. Uh, uh, no, I oh, know it's just a blue slide. Okay, yeah, so. Yeah, so here we're going to work like the stabilizer of the screen theory code, and we've done the modification that I haven't had on like all the vertical uh, qubits. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so we get, yeah, we get those new, new stabilizers. Uh, so what happens at these things that bias? As always, you can sort of forget all the blue sync. You can focus on like the X part of the, of the stabilizers. <laughs> And we can look at the materialized symmetries. So we see that we have one for the vertices, which is the one that just align, and we have one for the um, uh, for, for the packets as well. For like two types of vertical packets, we have those similar symmetries. This picture I think confusing. This one? Yeah. This one. Right. I mean, so the the plaque, sorry, the vertex star thing, right? You have like four things in the horizontal plane mm -hmm. and two red ones vertically, right? Mm -hmm. So what is that? Is that the product of all of them along one line? Yeah, but why is the red stuff present then? Doesn't it cancel? Oh, it does cancel. Yeah. Uh, ah. Just to indicate the line. That's exactly what the symmetry is, though. Yeah. No, no, but, no. But that's not the product, not the same yeah, line. Product. Sorry, product. Sorry, no, 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 the left. But they can sell. They can sell. But maybe that's the red here is confusing. Yeah, yeah, that was. Okay. Because the blue thing doesn't cancel. The blue that's, thing doesn't cancel. But the but red one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The red. You were just asking about the red. Yeah, I should probably make this a bit better. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, okay. That, that was confusing. Yeah. Let's see what's confusing. Yeah. I think it's a good thing. <laughs> 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 yeah. so like, the, like this operator on the left, on the red links, oh, it's exactly. identity, and yeah. the blue on the blue links, it's not identity. Yes, yeah, so that's true. Right? And in the picture on the right, the red edges are axes, and the blue edges are the legs. So it's kind of no. No, that's not the same. Uh, yeah, the blue same is color. always set and red is always X. No, but on the left, there, red is not X, red is identity. Yeah, I agree. I mean, mine right as well. Yeah, so yeah. here I think like this is red square. Like, yeah. bubble, it's red yeah. square. Everybody. Like this time is small, and this time is bold. Yeah. Okay, so like the symmetry is the product of the yes. stabilizers and consists only yes. of sets. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so we can expect this. That is a smart AI symmetry and some repetition card and not even very predictions like that. Right? So easy. Uh, okay, so I won't go into the detail of the color card because it's slightly complicated, but like for instance, one simple case is like for the cells. So okay, so the information we use is that like Hanamar is on all those like uh, all those purple things here. So you need have the cells now are like four bottom stairs. So like the cell has supported on the purple qubits. Um, and so what happens is that we have material asymmetry here in the depth. And once we saw, so that allows us to like find those slides, those parity checks. So that's a red prediction. And then we use this, once we have solved like all those uh, new parity checks, we have a new coding program and it's just like repetition cuts a lot. So that's like a direct application of like the red prediction. You do this uh, deformation along every line. Yeah. So, so the there are in the in the picture. Yeah, but what I mean is that it doesn't repeat after every layer or after, yeah. after every other layer. Every layer. Every layer. Okay. So. Oh, you really hear about like red and. and yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if it's just one it's color, 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 or but it's every color, but long. Okay. So we just do like material asymmetry in one direction, material asymmetry in the second direction using the new uh, parity checks. And that gives us uh, the 50% threshold proof of the cells. And there is like a more complicated technique that's involved like many, many steps for like the test. So that one we need to do. Extreme model is also like deformation along like one axis. Um, and we can show that it's equivalent to like an XY model for the cubes. Uh, and the exploit like just simple that I like symmetry for the vertices. 
okay, then maybe like I can talk a little bit about like the numerics. So that's we also look at like five final bias analysis. Uh, so here is the bias ratio. So how much is that? They are than X. So like 0 0.5 is like sort of depolarizing, then the then infinity means that we have like a Z like a only Z errors. So we use like two types of decoder. One is BPOSD using like uh, your Yoshka's library as you can see, and one is uh, screen matching, which is something like specific to screen uh, to screen codes. Uh, and we show mostly that like uh, okay, so what are the curves? So people have been formed that like red and orange. Uh, well, like, so is it all the same code but different decoders? Can I give you yeah. a plot? Okay. It's two codes, so you have the Clifford deform and the original story code. And so Clifford deform is only red. So let's, for instance, focus on like only DQ and only one type of decoder. Uh, yeah, so green and red. Yeah, so okay. green and red. Let's only look at green and red. We see that like the green one in the original code, and we see that it's like has a bigger threshold okay. than the modified cuts up to a certain bias. Like around like a hundred, which is a hundred, and then above that, uh, the cut becomes bigger. So it's sort of like threshold in the bias after which the modified curves become. But for bias in the other direction, small bias, like no, I don't care about the other direction. No. The other direction. I mean, if, if if x and y else are more like blue. Because you can always modify your code. Yeah, but uh, it would be an equivalent um, deformation, right? I mean, for any deformation, there is a, a yeah. right? for any error, there's a kind of deformation of this type. But of course, it would be just a replacement of. I of, mean, you you have to put the the dot in in your in your oh, plot. Those, those not here. No, at bias zero point five. Yeah. Yes. What's higher, green or red? Uh, red, right? It should be the same. It be the same, yeah. And the polarizing theory is the same. So like green is like all three bases errors are yeah. equally likely. So ah, that is ah, I so thought, don't, uh, sorry, I thought that was at one. No, no, ah, that's at zero point five. Okay, I see. Yeah. It looked a bit like like green was on the bottom. So the ratio is something like you have the X and ah. the Z. Um, with the ratio between like uh, you have two two uh, rates, one x, one z. The ratio thereof is okay. yeah, so it's like the f of z or half of the ratio, and then the, the and then you have a y array, which is the product of the two rates. Uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Here right now you just define like p z over p x plus p y. Ah, over p x plus p y. Okay. Yeah, so basically we see that like this like behavior in 3D codes. Uh, well, like you only like on the people different codes only because they are first in bias. Because like those 3D codes are already like pretty good in like bias noise without deformation, which is not the case for the surface code. Uh, like the surface code decreases, the stress of decreases when you have bias noise. But for like the original 3D codes, uh, usually you have an increase in threshold. Because you have the difference between the loop sector and the point sector, and loop sectors are much easier to decode. So they're like natural, they have natural ability to the practice. And the IQ model, we see the same behavior, or like there is like a lower, like the deformed version becomes better at a lower price. Okay. Do we have um, plots where this is compared to the X is the X code, for example, because yeah. like how fast it approaches this 50%. So, to be exact, it's like it's not this curve, but this curve is a hashing bomb, and yeah. this is very close to the hashing yeah. bomb. Uh, so, we can, after like a certain bias, we can like, this is basically the exact same curve. So, we can like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I don't know the hashing bound too well. That's obviously um, it's a Shannon bound applied to a quantum channel. So it's a classical bound. Yeah. <laughs> so there is like this like conjecture that the hashing bound is a bound for like CSS codes. Yeah. At least for the surface codes, like it seems to be true. For many CSS codes, it's not true. We have examples of exactly. it. So yeah, X is an X in example. Yeah. Well, because it's like it goes like a little bit too yeah. But it's a numerical. Value of the hashing bound in these codes the same. 
Yeah, the Hashimoto is kind of all right now. Like, no, so not like the number of qubit control doesn't enter. No, no, no. no. Just the type of code doesn't. Yeah. It's a function of the error property. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just a PS2 or two. Okay, okay. Like, so can I ask before you do this the, the, the clipper deformation? So the, the blue and the green, although you don't do the clipper deformation, you can still see that if you have a little bit of a performance goes up. Yes. That's because you have more of the errors that are created to the other one is yes. the loops. Yes. And Normal. if you were to use the other version of the color cup where you hotomart every qubit, so the where the support of the different supplies is exactly switch. Then you have a guess how this would look. Like it would probably decrease. Decrease. But then, what if you clip it for the subject loss? I am wondering why is the clip reform? Is there a way to clip reform it that you have this advantage from the get go? Did you try this? Uh, can you repeat that? So he refers to without different deformations for long biases, you're doing better, but there's a lot of different different deformations you could do. And you look at one of them, the one that you showed, right? Yes. Um, so I'm wondering if doing different different deformations or starting with different ways of writing the color code before. So that's the surface code. code. Oh, that's the surface code. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. You don't do information for the well, but there's still the tool to the surface code. Still get so I think my, my question still doesn't end the like the color code too much. Like you can also take the kind of the dual of the surface code where you just put the X and the set stabilizes on, on the output. So on you probably the want more um instead of one like as many loops as possible in a way. So like so like sometimes you have one that's very good. And it's, yeah, I think we like looked a little bit like an intuitive bit into that course. We probably also like to, yeah, maybe each other as well. Um, or do you even know how many ways there are to clip before many of these solids to, to like get these materialized symmetries? Yeah, one way, I mean, you, usually we sort of want symmetries of this shape, like from the symmetric way. So there's not that many ways to do it, I think. Uh, but if you don't issue the non symmetry deformations, then probably you have But I don't know. I don't know that's a non symmetric deformation. Like if you have from one qubit, like, yeah, maybe you cannot actually, you can do the transition bar. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay, that's okay. Um, so Marcus, can you just say, I didn't catch what you said. Do you explain why the CSS code for low bias, uh, for low bias performed better than the Clifford deformed one? So, so there were these two different types of syndromes, the ones that are point-like syndromes at the end of loops of errors, uh, strings of errors, mm -hmm. and the other one was the loops at the boundary of the membrane of errors, right? And okay. they, they are errors depending on if you have X or Z type errors, they either form strings or membranes, and you get the endpoints there or the boundaries there of a zero syndrome. Okay. So in the 3D Tor code, I always forget which way, way around it is, but I think you're... Mm -hmm. Vertex stabilizers are X type stabilizers. Uh, Z type stabilizers? Uh, the white six ones. The vertex in my convention are Z type stabilizers. Yeah. So they detect X errors, and these X errors kind of look like loops, and you only have X violations or these violations of the endpoints of these loops. And there, I wouldn't expect to get a high threshold against this type of noise. Whereas the X, uh, the Z errors, <laughs> they violate like plaquette stabilizers or two cell stabilizers. And there, the syndromes always look like these loops around the membrane of errors. I see. Okay, so, so by deforming, so if you deform your stabilizers, then you have um... You don't even deform it here. It's just that you have a different quality of support where your different stabilizers live, which in turn means that the dimensionality of low weight errors, which give you, um, well, low weight, um, low syndrome weight errors. Okay. okay. They either look like strings or membranes, but the boundaries are violated. I see. And you want to run to have the membrane type. I see. It's a bit more deep into it. Because my question was going to be, or sorry, thank you. But what happens at around, is there something special that happens at around eight to, I guess, 20, where uh, you yeah. notice these clips for deformation codes are performing better mm -hmm. than the standard CSS? Yeah, can I understand the value at which that happens? I don't understand it. <laughs> Yeah, just a numerical value. I don't have like an numerical understanding. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So are you? So uh, does this have a? Is this single shot on one type? There's no. There's cut capacity. Everything's good. 
Ah, uh, uh, okay. So, did you ever try doing uh, just a single full single shot decoding for it? I think it's you might see a. I think that's worth trying because yeah, see, so the difference between the TFS code and this is quite little, like for code capacity. I think it would be a lot bigger for single shots if you can find a way of performing the massive codes. I agree, but I think it's not maybe it's not worth like doing like just incremental views like this, this type of thing, but maybe worse like doing the actual full experiment, maybe like the sort of like gauge cuts where like single shot and like all the good properties of 3D cuts combined together and then like convert it to 3D cuts. That yeah. would be like the next experiment. So let's sweep matching so bad for the different Yeah, it's pretty bad. I think I think it, so I think it's good that like strip the strip decoder is like for the group sector is like very heuristic. Uh, just like in our in our all experiments that one like that one pretty badly. Uh, we don't even know sort of like if it doesn't trust so it's like yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, yeah, I'm just the sweep decoder, if I remember correctly, you kind of sweep everything into one direction, right? Until it hopefully disappears. Did you change this direction at all? Because now you have like this, you have this isotropy in your code because you delivered a formal mode, like a long sorry. Oh, um, I'm not sure. I think this is it's okay. I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, so that's the I'm still not sure if that would then. But it's like, it's like, what that would be on. Uh, because what, what would the sweet decoder do kind of on the repetition code? That's the question. It, push <laughs> on the wrong side of the repetition. Yeah, but that's, you're just going to be. But yeah, you just compare the like, threshold this area. Well, you have to estimate on the way what logic of the error will be. Uh, it doesn't just sweep, it keeps track of what it's left and because it's like, Based on that, it estimates the magic. Yeah, yeah no, for me, it's just the maybe that's also the reason it doesn't work classically. Is correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. For me, we don't know how to look at the new bears on the screen because it's like we, we don't have any new things. So, mm -hmm. so, so, what would you expect the result to be? Uh, Compared to like an X at set X code, if you use the maximum likelihood decoder. Here I think if you use the least, or probably close to, to maximum likelihood, I would say. Okay, because maximum likelihood is at bias like 100 above the hashing bound, right? So threshold is twice as low. Uh, do you know why? Or I don't know, why are 3D codes or 2D codes in this setting? Uh, is there some I mean, the match, small intuition? Yeah, the matching is 3D, right, for instance. But like, if you just, just take into account like the vertices, matching is 3D, 3D. So it's worse than like to be, to be matching as a word threshold. So it's like 1% instead of like 10%. I mean, the, just the code capacity, 3D codes have the yeah, in general, like that's kind of for depolarizing or for like, uh, yeah, for depolarizing, for instance, the threshold also because it works. Uh, okay, and why? Because, like, for instance, yeah, let's say just matching because we do matching in speed, we still not doing matching. Uh, okay. So it has the same matching threshold for like just the vertex and like the, when you're measuring. So each constant. syndrome has higher number of errors or something, yeah. And that's kind of the bottleneck, like the word, the most difficult to debug in terms of information. Okay, okay, thanks. Okay, I probably don't have much time, but I wanted to talk a bit about like code modeling and surface scaling. Um, like what do you think by the sense of those two powerful font cuts? Uh, and the answer is that it depends on the modeling conditions and the conditions. <laughs> so let's look at the simple example. So I have an animation for that one. So. Let's look at the normal, like, let's say that's a normal like, the next ones, like here. Uh, so as we said, we can move the Z, we have only like those two body things. Here the vertices are, uh, the qubits are vertices. And if we try to like propagate onions on the diagonal, 
we see that the logical is just going to be like a string uh, that has length L. But now we could take co prime dimensions. So, like for instance, here is L and here is L plus one. Uh, you can prove that what's going to happen is that you're going to like sort of wrap around this, the turret. So, you're not, instead of like going back to the same point, you're wrapping around. And you can show that you're going to wrap around the whole turret before going back to itself. Um, so, that's a property of like GC, like a GCDs. And um, yeah, so basically, here is a logical impact property. It's nice. And as a consequence, we have an improved subtle scaling that we can bias. Uh, now the logical array becomes like extension minus alpha n to square n to number of units. And all, in our work, uh, we found a co frame related 3D codes uh, that has a pure and logical supported of all open cubing with the lattice of some specific dimensions, uh, which are co prime, but not only co prime, it's like they have to be there are some specific values modulo for the machine. So it has to be like uh, LX has to be equal to like one or two modulo. And the reason is like one of those two has to be like you have to have point plus two uh, either here or here. So like one of like either LX or Y has to be point plus two. Is that the only possibility? So yeah, it doesn't work. And like when you don't have those things, then the logic becomes just like a sheet. So it's not the one that the fault. And you put this on the street or is that's on the street? Uh, that's in the two. So it's like the thing is like we only have like very good conditions here and here. We don't have very good conditions right here. Because yeah, some specific number of conditions. Probably will even matter what you have in the in the third direction. But depending. Yeah, probably it will make the direction. Mm -hmm. And one of the ones that has to be not only even, but for n plus two. Yeah, one of them has to be one of those because, like, you divide by two at some point, and you want that to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, the reason is like in the proof, like there's some specific details in the proof where you use the fact that, like, one of those dimensions, you can write like two. Yeah, thanks. I guess I'll have to look at it later. <laughs> okay, so in conclusion, uh, 3D cards have many useful properties, such as uh, single photo photo correction, uh, the presence of transverse multiple for gates, and some partial separation for some cards. Uh, but the thinking where well, they are better than 2D cards is yet to be found. Uh, it's naturally improved the bias noise, but for very large bias, we found some default deformation that can push uh, performance even further. And uh, we can use symmetries and weight reduction to show that these are different cards have a GCD bus interest. So that's sort of like new, I mean, the weight reduction part is like a new technique that you can use for like different cards. So for instance, for the 2D color code that um, they use like some people here, uh, that we can also use this like weight reduction uh, And there are a few open questions. Uh, the first one is all costs taken into account. So if you take like circuit of noise gates, the circuit of noise, like we simulate all the gates, etc., I can see the cuts on an advantage compared to two D cuts and the bias noise. And the second one, uh, it's a sort of conjecture we uh, described in the paper, which is do all stabilizer cuts, or maybe just all topological cuts have a different version with 50% reversal. Because every cut we tried so far, we found a different version with 50% reversal. Mm -hmm. And Okay, thanks.